Your Excellency, my brother, no one was in Kuroko, Chikawa State, our very own Secretary, I am a very own Dr. Adisha of the African Development Bank, the publisher Business Day, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed a homecoming for me. Uh, just a few apologies. Sorry, I'm wearing my glasses. I have to moderate the amount of lights coming into my retina. Um, I want to start by thanking Business Day for inviting me. It's homecoming. Maybe they want me to come and give a account of my stewardship in the last six and a half, seven years in Edo State, which I will gladly do. But more importantly, to see how some of the themes I will touch on today will essentially set the tone for the broader conversation which Dr. Adesha is going to lead about how to get the lion to run how to grow our economy. Because without which we will support to my continue to support to my continent. Um, can I have the slides on? Yes. So, so this morning I'm just going to quickly go through several slides and please permit me to spend about five minutes of about the 20, 15 minutes allocated. Um, in those days, like I said, this is an example for Nigeria, it can be compared to 24 other states, you know, 5 million people. The difference here is we're highly urbanized, about 70% of our population is spread across three major cities. We have a very vibrant youth population like the country has. We have, you know, fairly large, that's about the land, but the difference here is quite really because we have a landmass, France, some rainforest and the Sahel. The unique advantage, the Edo advantage, which we continue to have, is that if you put a pin in the next city, within a three hour radius, there are 17 million people. That tells the closeness to our markets. And in terms of location, and you know, location is everything. You can't go from the east to the west or to south south without going through the state. So with these advantages, just like our country has so many other advantages, we have tried to leverage as a state in terms of fostering growth. For us, what we're trying to do is just lay out our whole uh, policy on investment growth and industrialization on a few key pillars. First, ensuring that we focus on the engine of government, bureaucracy. Because if government does not work, the economy will not work. Ten, we to focus on developing talent, because it's all about people. That's why we're government. And the economy is not going to run on its own. People have to drive the economy. We looked at policies that support business. He also looked at providing infrastructure, core infrastructure. And I have to see as I'll show you these guys having a digital infrastructure. And this, I mean, I would say, last but not least, is creating an environment of law, order, and security. So, what have we done the last six, seven years? We've essentially tried to rebuild that bureaucracy. We've reached the civil service. That, those pictures there are the pictures of some of our offices. Our offices compared with any corporate offices. Uh, the offices that civil service will have compared with any corporate offices any of you will have in links. But what's been unique is we try to use technology for governments. I said to the American companies that I'll be the last government in the States that will work with paper files. So we're moving the whole platform digital. Because the civil service we inherited from the British 
One, it has been radically improved in places like Australia and even in the UK. We remain stagnant. But, so what we try to do is, in a new, is to really just look at our processes end to end and see how first you can you know, to, to refresh them, but also to digitize them. Um, so for many people, we focused on training, training, training. And also kept our eyes on how we recruit to try and depoliticize recruitments and start very mobilizing into the political But make sure that the core of the civil service is now recruited on a merit based system. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you've heard many a good key who has in first class, anyone or not, has an automatic employment in the civil service immediately in the graduate. Um, we we also focus on business spending policies in terms of taking advantage of the federal government, uh, social investment tax rate, and a few of our, uh, a few of our partners have you know, come to invest on building roads. We looked at some of our laws, created a tourism master plan, and today we're working on a 30-year development plan and a 30-year master plan for the city and the regional plan for the state. We've, for us, it's about people focusing on um, talents. And we realize that our foundational learning was very, very weak. And that was, on the studies, when we had to tackle, deal with the issue of human trafficking. So our emphasis over the last six years has been to strengthen foundational learning. Because without that, we cannot build anything else in terms of developing talents. We looked and looked again at the entire educational policy, which is really unfortunate. Uh, maybe it's just an opportunity to let you know that the biggest challenge we have in Nigeria today is a dysfunctional educational system. Because 25 years ago, we changed the educational policy to a 634 system, but we did not, we did not align that change to the realities. So take, for instance, after a child leaves primary six, the child is supposed to go into junior school, at least in the public school system. The junior school and the senior schools, in most cases, still operate within the same premises. In the meantime, the government structure for the junior school is UBEC, federal, whereas the government structure for the senior school is the states. They don't talk to each other. So what we found is that the drop-off ratio between primary six P6 and SS1 is over 50% on average across the country. And that's what you see on the streets with this Alaye or this Alaye people who are And until we begin to focus on that, we will be able to have a major crisis in terms of global talent and manpower. So we focus on, you know, for us, it's like less certificate more handbook. Let's focus on technical education. So we learned our colleges of agriculture, colleges of nursing sciences, colleges of um, technical college and colleges of education. I will try to activate them. And thinking is, look, we don't have a problem you traveling. We like to travel, but to get the certificates and make sure we're making sure that whatever our training our international international standard, so if you have to travel, you don't go out irregularly in the middle. Like I said, we're supporting vocational education because there's a huge population of kids who have fallen through the cracks, but they're talented. So we're partnering with you know, various companies in the area of technology. Uh, we have a program with the Decathlon where we're training kids for the software, com uh, computing, and engineering. We, in terms of entertainment, we're working with a lot of producers. In fact, this year alone, we're shooting in excess of uh, over 20 or 30 Hollywood movies in Benin because we've created the infrastructure for, for artists and producers to come. Next slide. Um, but more importantly for business, we've been working with the private sector on infrastructure. As you all recall, uh, eight, nine years ago, we 
what we need is a group of investors to build the Azura 450 megawatt plant, which is next door to an existing NIPP plant, which has a capacity of 150 megawatts. And from that experience, we were able to reach out to other investors because those two power plants to supply power into the state, to supply power into the grid. But from the experience gathered with them, what we can have an investor, today we have a 95 uh, megawatt plants uh, um, generating facility, you know, 30 kilometers from the city center, from one of the NMPC of uh, supplying 95 megawatts, uh, generating 95 megawatts. And that experience and push made us one of the frontier states in electricity reform in Nigeria. So today, the state has its own re electricity regulatory agency where we can now license people who want to generate, to distribute uh, electricity into our state. We are also very, very gumbo on technology. Um, we are working with companies like Mimon and IHS has swapped right away for fiber optic connections. And today, I believe that it is the most connected state digital in Nigeria. We have by October this year, we would have completed 1,600 kilometers of fiber optic connections to all the local governments in the state. And by quarter one next year, we expect to to construct another 300 kilometers linking all all the secondary schools and our primary health care centers. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, the managing director of MTN is here because I've been thinking how do I reach out to him because I need him to give me bandwidth. In the area of law and order and security, we've done well. Um, in the state we met, it's no longer the state it is. I know that if you ask people, what about it? You know what you know about it? The state it used to be the kidnapping capital of this, uh, of this country. Today, we are in control of law and order. And, uh, just working with the communities, investing in the communities, giving them the resources, uh, we reduce, drastically reduce the incidence of violent crimes. You recall the kidnap, the train kidnap in the state, and within 72 hours we were able to resolve it because we have this structure. So, just to round up, uh, for us, just like the country, there's so many advantages we have to share, a share of the country. And the key is how do you lean on those advantages. And what we have done is to look at the areas, five areas we I think we have a very, very strong advantage and have tried to attract private sector partners into the business. First, in terms of industry, I want to thank Dr. Tradition. You may not know this. While he was the Minister for Agriculture, you commissioned a company to design six agricultural parks, Mahindra, out of Chennai. When you left office, I ran into them. I went to them in Chennai, and I didn't have the kind of money you had to pay them. But I used the fact that you had paid them so much to negotiate a very good deal with them. And they came back and designed for me three facilities. That's the Bini Industrial Park. Next slide. Bini Industrial Park, and we also did something for our, our film village. That's the Bini Industrial Park. It's almost a thousand hectares. It's next door to the industrial plant, so we have gas, we have electricity. It's you know, close to Coco Port, and today the first phase has already been completed about 50 hectares by the, um, the uh, Nigerian Content Development, the Local Content Development Board, and we're working with other developers to see how we can expand interest and investments in because it's, it's a no-brainer. The land is there, there's power, there's electricity, uh, there's electricity, and there's water. We have somebody also attracted you know, investors in the area of modular refinery, just since we have gas access that our landlords 
together in the modular refineries and utilize the feedstock. So we have two modular refineries in the United States. One that we partnered with the Chinese on, and another that the local cotton board is also has also supported. Next slide. We, like I said, are very comfortable on technology. So we partnered with uh, Decagon and a few other companies. And today we graduated the sixth cohort from a temporary site of a tech park. And we have we're commencing the development of the permanent site of the tech park in the next uh, Q4. Uh, that's the permanent site. The design is ready and the infrastructure work in the 25 hectare purpose-built industry park. Our goal is to ensure that we, by you know, in the next three to five years, produce nothing less than 5,000 software engineers in the United States. We're looking at Estonia. We don't see any reason why a state like Estonia, a country like Estonia, that has less than 2 million people, a population of the United States, is taking so much digital business globally. Those are the kind of countries we're looking at to compete with. We're also pushing retail building, retail, working with shop rights, commissioning. Our first major shopping mall, uh, six shops with everybody. But what's different here is that we're also going to have a library <coughs> in the mall. Next slide. Uh, but the, this we're very excited about because this, this is what makes Edo different. When you talk about the Edo advantage, what Edo has that nobody else has on the continent is our culture. Um, so we've been working hard with various groups. Returns of artifacts. But what beyond returns? We think let us, when you come to our state, then you must see our culture. So we are redesigning the city center into a cultural district, about 10 hectares within the city center, that's housing museums. We have the National Museum, we have the Museum of West African Arts, which designs are ready. We also are talking about the Royal Museum. And um, we work has started on the cultural district, which we expect to be ready by the first quarter next year. In fact, the pavilion, storage facilities for the artifacts that have been written, is currently being used. And we expect that's it. And this will store. Um, this will store most of the works that are coming. But more importantly, for the first time in 60 years, this massive um, archaeological works currently going on in the city now to just find to for more finds. And we expect that we'll be able to uh, store them. Um, we have storage facilities for them. Lastly, our goal has been to de risk agriculture. Um, we for us as a government, our business is not business, it's not doing really business, it's not to compete with the private sector, it's to support the private sector. And so what we do, the way we've approached it, is to help with land acquisition. Um, and beyond helping you acquire land, we actually engage the communities using our political networks to make sure that we are able to have access to the land that's been allocated. And then support manpower training. We're building uh, College of Agriculture, in which our agricultural partners are members of the Government Council of our schools, so that they can help us define the programs to be required, the quality and type of manpower for their use. Our priority costs are all, um, we have the largest all um, program, or the big uh, all um, program in, on the continent, so allocated 62,000 hectares and to about seven companies, we are currently cultivating, and we are going to go through another lot next, uh, this year, for another 60,000 hectares. So, just talking to the Indonesian um, ambassador here, I said, well, we've, we've, we've been to them to talk with them to see how we can collaborate in terms of manpower development. Next time. Yes, we've um, 
This is a very interesting project with another partner. Um, it's just going to be ready by Q4, and it's an industrial scale ethanol plant out of cassava. We gave the application for land for cassava cultivation, which is already done, and also the land for the construction of 40, 400 metric ton per day cassava plants. That's really something we're very really happy and proud of. Yes, I told uh, Dr. Dishman that we are the second largest market for second hand uh, vehicles in Nigeria during the past presentation, and this is who are. Then, uh, carbon footprint. We have to do something about that carbon footprint. We already have to do something about that carbon footprint. Uh, we have we see forestry as a major resource. We unfortunately suffered massive deforestation, but we are working with a lot of agencies to see how we can get capital into reforestation. I want to launch the, one of the most aggressive reforestation programs in the continent. We have started with about 10,000 hectares this year, and I'm hoping that we should be able to recover another 200,000 uh, hectares of forests in the next five years. <laughs> and then lastly, 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 you see, we just must have all seen in the news this week, that after five, seven, 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 seven years of talking about rebuilding our ports, don't forget, in the 14th century we had a port. The Portuguese came to the States to trade with us, and we, there was a port, they landed somewhere, they were built on the way they were somewhere. But somehow we lost it. And for the last 70 years, we've been thinking how do we rebuild the port, you know, from the, using the bite of Benin and the Benin River. And we finally were able to, after five years of work, get a preferred leader um, to come in to work with us as a motor energy of Africa, to work with us to build a Benin River port which will be one of the closest ports to the belly of Nigeria, to the mid middle of Nigeria. Um, designs have been done, and we expect that we should commence construction before Q1 next year. We are, like I said, a hub, so this week there's a lot of traffic, particularly uh, trailer traffic that goes across our state. And we're investing in trailer transit pass. We currently have two investors working on, and we expect that once they've done these are samples, uh, we're holding companies like Dango Delmoa, who have production facilities in the state, and we're getting them to commit to ensure that we, we have um, the logistics facilities to handle their transactions. So, so thank you. Uh, I have a whole list of partners who have been working with us over the last six years. Um, I believe that many of you, some of you are here, and the list just goes on and on. And if your name is not here, then please, you're missing out. And this is an opportunity to come on board. Thank you.